Hello everyone, I'm your Mina Van Dyken, MD from Out of the Doldrums. How are you? What's happening in your corner of the world? What's new? I know what's new. It's 2020! Happy New Year's. We here at Out of the Doldrums sincerely wish the best for you in 2020. May all your dreams and desires come to fruition, and may that keep you out of the doldrums. Last week, a review article was published in the New England Journal of Medicine about intermittent fasting. It's been getting quite a bit of press. Why is that? What's so special about this paper compared to other papers that are published on the same topic? Let's take some time today to review the paper and intermittent fasting in general. But before I start, a few initial thoughts I want to share with you on intermittent fasting. I know it seems to be an up and coming trendy thing to do, and this is for good reason. There is a fair amount of high quality evidence supporting fasting. However, Fasting is not a replacement for an unhealthy diet. This is really important. What do I mean by this? Well, it is not okay to undergo intermittent fasting and then eat like crap the remainder of the time. Fasting will not and should not compensate for unhealthy dietary habits. The first and foremost way to improve your overall health is with diet, not with fasting. Second, and I'll emphasize this again at the end, Always check with your doctor before you embark on a huge change like intermittent fasting. It's best to have your medical team on your side and supportive of the changes you would like to make. Lastly, there's some populations that we just don't know how intermittent fasting will affect them. A good example of this are people who are over 65 years old, people with type 1 diabetes, women who are trying to conceive, pregnant or breastfeeding, and children. These people might want to sit out on the fasting train until we have more studies and more information on their particular conditions. Okay, so back to this landmark paper. It was written by Rafael de Cabo and Mark Matson. Both of these guys are PhDs and they're both heavyweights in the aging field. Rafael de Cabo is an American scientist and he's the branch chief of the Translational Gerontology Branch at the National Institute on Aging, which is a division of the U.S. National Institutes of Health. Mark Matson is a professor of neuroscience at Johns Hopkins University. Both of these PhDs have dedicated their careers to healthy aging research. So, back to the paper. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine on December 26, 2019. This is notable because it was not published in just any journal. This article was published in what is arguably one of the most rigorously peer-reviewed journals that exists. The science has to have credibility in order to be published in this journal. They don't just publish anything. This paper is elegantly written, and they begin by discussing the history behind the study of fasting and caloric restriction. They then dive into the science of why intermittent fasting seems to work. Finally, they talk about the studies demonstrating the benefits on health, aging, and disease in humans. So let's review the history. It starts with an article published in 1997 which described caloric restriction over a lifetime and how it has remarkable effects on aging and the lifespan of animals. Initially, scientists thought this was because there was less production of oxygen-free radicals, which are known to be toxic. So scientists began to investigate whether this was truly the case, and what they found was that many of the health benefits of intermittent fasting were not simply the result of reduced free radical production or weight loss. They found that during fasting, a switch gets flipped and cells activate pathways that improve their defenses against stressors. This has become referred to as flipping the metabolic switch. Further studies continued, and scientists showed how effective intermittent fasting was on animal models. They studied animal models of obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancers, and even neurodegenerative brain diseases like Alzheimer's. Finally, scientists moved on to humans where they found an improvement in many of these same parameters. Let's take some time to talk about the science of intermittent fasting. If you're not the science-y type, please bear with me. This will only be a quick segment lasting a few minutes, then we'll get back to the more practical stuff shortly. For everyone else, put on your science caps. Let's go. Okay, there's two main sources of energy for our cells that we feed off of, glucose and fatty acids. After we eat a meal, typically glucose is used for energy and fat is stored in our fat tissues as triglycerides. When we fast, after we've used all our glucose stores, triglycerides are broken down into fatty acids, which are used for energy. The liver converts these fatty acids to ketone bodies, which become the major source of energy for many tissues. When this happens, our body is in a state called ketosis. Many tissues can use ketones for fuel, including the heart and the brain. 
it takes our bodies fasting at least eight hours, usually more like 12 or 14 hours before we enter ketosis. And it appears that ideal metabolic adaptation occurs at 10 to 14 hours of fasting. At that time, the metabolic switch is flipped. What does that really mean? Well, the free fatty acids triggered a few different things to occur. Firstly, some of them get converted to ketones, mainly in the form of acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate. These get transported throughout the body where they can be metabolized into a molecule called acetyl-CoA and ultimately ATP, which is our main energy source. Beta-hydroxybutyrate also has other functions like activating transcription factors and expressing brain-derived neurotrophic factor in neurons. This increase in brain-derived neurotrophic factor results in something called neurogenesis, or generation of new neurons in the brain. We see increased antioxidant defenses. We see increased DNA repair. Other effects of these molecules include improved performance, increased resistance to stress, increased autophagy, which is destruction of damaged or aged cells. Lastly, there's an increase in mitochondrial biogenesis, or the generation of mitochondria. Mitochondria are hugely important when it comes to cellular metabolism and efficiency. All of these effects that we see are hugely important to our body when it comes to resistance of our cells and our organs to stressors. So what happens when we start refeeding, when we flip that metabolic switch again and start eating? Well, pretty much the opposite. After we've been in fasting mode, the body now has the resources to begin tissue repair and remodeling. This results in growth of beneficial cells. It appears that humans have adapted to have this type of response and cycling between intermittent fasting and periods of recovery or refeeding. Long-term adoption of this strategy can result in increased insulin sensitivity, increased heart rate variability, which is a good thing, improved lipid metabolism, healthy gut microbiome, it can reduce abdominal fat, it can reduce inflammation, and it can reduce blood pressure. Overall, the result is increased resilience to stress and increased disease resistance. Pretty cool science, huh? Okay, so how does intermittent fasting affect muscle mass? Well, one study looked at young, healthy men who fasted for 16 hours a day for two months. These men also did resistance or weight training. This study found that these men lost fat while maintaining muscle mass. So don't feel like you're gonna get shrimpy if you are an intermittent faster. How does intermittent fasting affect cognition and memory? This clinical trial looked at older adults who underwent caloric restriction, and they found they had improved verbal memory. Another study looked at overweight adults with mild cognitive impairment. They found that 12 months of caloric restriction led to improvements in their verbal memory, executive function, and global cognition. Lastly, a large randomized clinical trial done over two years showed that daily caloric restriction led to a significant improvement in working memory. Clearly, we need more studies in regards to intermittent fasting and memory loss or dementia, but these preliminary results are super promising. The data behind intermittent fasting is strongest in treatment of six main categories. Stay tuned for future videos where we'll review each of these categories individually. These categories were chosen by the authors of that New England Journal paper. The first category is obesity and diabetes mellitus. Individuals who undergo intermittent fasting experience significant weight loss, and individuals with prediabetes and diabetes have been shown to experience reversed insulin resistance while undergoing intermittent fasting. The second category is cardiovascular disease and hypercholesterolemia high cholesterol. Intermittent fasting improves multiple indicators of cardiovascular health in humans, including blood pressure, resting heart rate, levels of HDL and LDL, cholesterol, triglycerides, glucose, insulin, and insulin resistance. In addition, intermittent fasting has been shown to reduce markers of systemic inflammation and oxidative stress. We know all these are associated with atherosclerosis and heart disease. The third category is cancer. Most of the studies we have on intermittent fasting and cancer are in animals. However, we're just starting to see the results of clinical trials involving humans with cancer. Most of the clinical studies that are initially done are proving that fasting is safe in the setting of cancer. One area that is quite promising is in patients with glioblastoma, which is an aggressive and deadly brain tumor. Intermittent fasting in these studies demonstrated suppressed tumor growth and extended survival. The fourth category is neurodegenerative disorders. We definitely need more human studies on this one. Animal studies are super promising, showing that intermittent fasting can delay onset and progression of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. 
Hopefully, more research on this comes to fruition soon. The fifth category is asthma, multiple sclerosis, and arthritis. These are lumped together because many times they have an autoimmune effect. In regards to asthma, weight loss reduces the symptoms of asthma in obese patients. One study demonstrated that alternate day fasting improved asthma symptoms and decreased airway resistance. In regards to multiple sclerosis, which is an autoimmune disorder, alternate day fasting was shown to have improved functional outcomes in a mouse model of multiple sclerosis. This was translated to humans in two separate studies where patients with multiple sclerosis who underwent intermittent fasting had reduced symptoms in a short period as two months. The mechanism of this is thought to be reduction in inflammation. Because of this, scientists also think that reduction in inflammation would be beneficial in treating rheumatoid arthritis, and there is one study supporting the use of intermittent fasting in arthritis. The last category is surgical and ischemic tissue injury. Preoperative fasting appears to reduce tissue damage and inflammation and can improve the outcomes of certain procedures. A large, multi-center, randomized study showed that two weeks of preoperative daily caloric restriction improved outcomes in patients that were undergoing gastric bypass surgery. Of course, more research is needed on this, especially with so many different surgical procedures being performed, and each procedure has its own individual nuances when it comes to preparation and recovery. Makes you want to intermittent fast, doesn't it? Well, now's a perfect time for me to remind you to check with your doctor first before embarking on any of this. You want to make sure you have your medical team on board. And as discussed a few minutes ago, there are some people for whom fasting may not be the best idea. Also, if you feel like you need additional medical supervision when you fast, there's various fasting clinics worldwide where medical experts will supervise a fast and they specialize in such matters. A good example of this is True North Health Clinic in Santa Rosa, California. Don't worry, they didn't bribe me or sponsor me in any fashion. So, let's talk a little bit about how we can implement intermittent fasting in our lives. Well, the easiest way is to start slowly. Don't go all, all hero, don't do it all at once. There's many different forms of intermittent fasting. So, we have options when picking which one is right for us. There's time-restricted feeding, which is where you eat in a six-hour window and fast for 18 hours. Other experts recommend an eating window of eight hours and a fasting period of 16 hours, which is much more doable. An example of this would be finishing dinner by 7 p.m. and not eating again the next day till 11 a.m. This sounds extreme, but it is something that can be achieved gradually. Experts, again, recommend making this change gradually over an extended period of time, like four months. Here's an example of how the transition could go. The first month, you start with a 10-hour feeding window for five days a week. The second month, you cut that feeding window down to eight hours, and you continue to do it only five days a week. The third month, you cut the feeding period down to six hours, and you keep it at five days per week. The last month, you extend that six-hour feeding period to seven days per week. Another popular intermittent fasting regimen is called 5-2 intermittent fasting, meaning two days a week, caloric intake is restricted to 500 calories. Again, experts recommend making this change slowly, ideally over a four-month time span. An example of this transition could be the first month picking one day per week where caloric intake is cut to 1,000 calories. The other six days of the week, you eat whatever you want. The second month, pick two days per week where the caloric intake is cut to 1,000 calories. The third month, Keep the same two days per week, but cut the calories to 750 calories. And then the fourth month, transition to two days per week with 500 calories a day. For me, personally, it seems like the time-restricted eating model is easier to adopt and more appropriate with my lifestyle. What do you guys think will work best for you? When people initially switch to intermittent fasting regimen, many people get hangry, or otherwise known as hungry or irritable. They've also been found in studies to have reduced ability to concentrate. Interestingly enough, though, these initial side effects, if you want to call them side effects, usually disappear within one month. Our body adapts. Isn't that crazy? So, in conclusion, this paper nicely summarizes the metabolic effects of intermittent fasting and most of the studied indications. As discussed above, the four main indications for intermittent fasting are obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. We know that we do not fully understand all the mechanisms behind why intermittent fasting seems to be advantageous, but we do know that flipping this metabolic switch is valuable to overall health and likely our longevity. Well, that's all I have for you today. 
Let me know what you think of this video. Let me know if you'd like me to take a deep dive into the different indications and benefits of intermittent fasting in future videos. Let me know if you've tried intermittent fasting. Let me know what your perception of it was. How did it make you feel? What results, if any, were there? Thanks for watching, everybody. Happy 2020, and until next time, aloha. I'm starving. I've been fasting. <laughs> Are you bananas? <laughs> bananas. No, not till you get your eight-hour feeding window. I'm so Are you hungry?